Okay, so today we're going to talk about online algorithms. Uh, this is a, a, a fun, uh, easy topic, probably one that I could have done much earlier um, uh, in the semester. Maybe next time I will. Uh, but it's a, it, online algorithms are sort of a nice setting where you can see where, where randomization is useful. You can do some things that you can't necessarily do deterministically. So I don't think we're going to introduce anything new technically in terms of probability. I think the probability will be the mathematical part will be pretty basic, but maybe the way we use it, the way we think about it will be new. And uh, the two applications we'll look at today, one is caching, okay, and the other is uh, buy or rent problems, uh, assuming we have time uh, for buy and rent. Okay, so let's start with, uh, with caching. So as I guess I'm assuming most of you know, uh, you know, memory on a computer is sort of arranged somewhat hierarchically, right? And there's different devices. So, you know, I guess, you know, at some level, especially if I kind of simplify things a little bit, all your memory is really backed up in some kind of hard drive. Okay, so there's some kind of copy there. And the hard drive is really big, okay? And it's a little bit slower, especially the old ones that actually had a spinning mechanical disk. So it actually takes like a second to start spinning from rest, okay? And then I guess on the other extreme, you have the CPU, which really only looks at like a constant amount of information at a piece of time, you know, just fills in a couple of registers, maybe adds them together, writes it to a third register or something like that, and writes that back out to memory, in principle, kind of making it back out to the hard drive uh, over time. Okay, but if it was just directly communicating between a hard drive and a CPU, and you know, you read two numbers from a hard drive, you put into the registers, you write back out, the, the bottleneck would just be reading and writing from the hard drive. Okay, so we have sort of intermediate layers of memory in between, the main one being RAM, okay? Uh, so flash memory, uh, which is a lot faster than hard drives and also is much better for random access compared to at least the disks, not necessarily the SSDs nowadays. Um, so the idea is that as some of the RAM is gonna store some of the kind of currently fresh and relevant data, a copy of the data that you're using right now from the hard drive. So at some level, the CPU only directly has to talk to the RAM. And meanwhile, you can figure out how to copy from RAM to, to disk in the background and stuff like that. And if you take operating systems, there's various strategies and stuff like that. And, you know, I didn't draw it here, but the CPU itself has actually smaller caches. It has a level one L1 cache and a level two L2 cache which are even closer to the CPU, so latency is even smaller. I think the L1 cache, last I checked, is like on the order of kilobytes, maybe hundreds of kilobytes. And L2 cache might be in single digit, double digit megabytes nowadays, right? Okay, so so those are even closer and, and it's kind of working hierarchically so that in principle, the CPU should only be talking to the L1, L1 talks to L2, L2 talks to RAM uh, and stuff like that. And if you can kind of anticipate or be smart about what you keep in those faster access, uh, then you're really not paying the time of, of hitting the disk, right? And, and, and you, yeah, so, uh, and that's, that's actually a really important uh, uh, practical thing. And it's, and it's, it's sort of like almost a software problem, this problem of deciding what to put in cache and what to leave out. Okay, the hardware's kind of already there, but there's still algorithmic decisions uh, to be made. So that's what we're gonna study. Uh, today, granted a somewhat simplified model. Okay, so, all right, so here's the model we're gonna study. Uh, let's say there's like N different kind of items, think of them all as being just the same size. Okay, N doesn't actually matter, it could just be an infinite number. But the real point is that there's K cache slots. Okay, so there's some limited number of slots. Uh, and uh, you're in an online model where kind of each round you get requested a different item, item one, item 10, item 20, okay? And the rule is uh, uh, every time an item gets requested, it needs to get served from cache. So you, if it's not already in your cache, you need to put it into one of those K slots, okay? Now, since N is much, much bigger than K, that means over time, uh, you're gonna really have to decide who you're gonna kick out of the cache. Okay, so initially the cache is empty, so you maybe fill up the, cache of the first K request. But then when it starts getting interesting on the K plus one request, 
where, okay, here's an item I definitely have to put into cache because that's the rule. And the question is, who do I kick out? So that's really our design decision, which is how do we decide which item to kick out of the cache, you know, and, and see which ones get different performance. Okay. So, um, right, so the question is who, who to evict? And, and so ideally, you know, okay, so what makes this sort of interesting is that you're serving these requests and you don't know what's coming in the future. So we're not like, I don't know, statistically modeling anything or anything like that. We're doing just worst case adversarial online requests, okay? So you don't really know what's coming up in the future. Ideally, I mean, ideally you wish you knew the future so that you can kind of leave in the items that are coming up next, right? So ideally we want, it, we want the items to already be in the cache when they're requested the tricky thing is we don't know what's going to be requested. So the bad bad thing is whenever I have to load an item into cache, that's called a cache miss. Okay. So our goal is to minimize uh, the number of cache misses. Make sense? I'm guessing many of you have been exposed to this to some extent before, like I was exposed to it in operating systems class. Okay. All right, so I guess I, just to make sure we're on the same page, I drew up an example for us. Uh, okay, so we have requests on the left and I guess a cache of size three um, on the right. Maybe I can ask you guys, uh, I'll ask you guys what to evict because in case one approach is better than others. So, okay, so the first request is number one and you just have to put that into the cache. There's nothing you can do. The next one, is two, you also put that into the cache. There's nothing you can do. I'll put an X whenever there's a cache miss. So there has to be a cache miss when there's a new request. Uh, the next one is number one. We already had that. So actually uh, we didn't have a cache miss. That's good. I guess I'll put a circle there. Okay. Round three, four, we have a new slot. That's a cache miss. So we've had three cache misses, but there's not much we could do about them. And I guess now is really the first time you have a decision. So we get requested item number three, and now our cache is actually full, so you have to kick somebody out. Who should I kick out? Here, four, okay, because you guys can see the future. You know that four is not, four is not coming up, okay? And then, uh, then you get five. Who should I get kick out? Three, okay. Okay, and then the next two, Oh, that's an X. Yeah, that's an X. Um, the next two um, are just fine because they're already there. Okay, good. So you get the guys get the rule of the game and you guys can also appreciate why it's easier if you knew the future requests. Okay. All right. So, okay. So that's some high level. Okay. Can we come up with some sort of smart caching strategies and, and improve performance? Okay. All right. So, uh, I'm sure you guys have heard of some of these things before. Does anyone want to suggest some strategies who to evict as a general rule? Okay, so what's LFU? Least frequent. Okay, so that's that's one. Oops. Least frequently used. So I guess uh, maybe you can, out of the items in your cache, you can... Uh, keep it like a counter every time I, I re-access something in the cache, I'll increase the counter and whatever has the smallest counter will get kicked out. Okay. You also said LRU, what does LRU stand for? These recently used. So I guess here, I don't know, you can either keep the items in some sorted order or you can keep like a timestamp of when everything was last accessed uh, or maybe in some kind of heap or queue or something. Um, and just get rid of the thing that was accessed the furthest in the past okay and then we'll study actually something that's a little bit more general than least recently used huh oh yeah we can do just random uh i didn't actually list that but why don't i uh totally random that probably wouldn't be the worst one on this list uh, but i'm not sure uh, sure, I, yeah, while, while we're here, any other ideas? Yeah. Ah, but in, in this in the actual model, not in the previous one, you don't get to see the future. Uh, in fact, I'm pretty sure, 
like now that I think about it, I'm pretty sure what I did last time is I was more clever and I used to scroll like this so you guys couldn't see the future. Uh, but uh, I forgot to do that, so it made it uh, it made it less fun or more fun, depending on if you like to see the answers or not. So maybe more fun. Okay. Uh, yeah. Any other any other ideas? The opposite. Oh, the most frequently used and the most recently used. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 certainly possible. It doesn't sound great. <laughs> let's 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 get rid of the most frequently used one. Um, but but hey, why not? Um, so the other one we'll study. I I think partly because it's 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 sort of simpler to study, is is actually a slightly a generalization of least recently used. So I call it not recently used, but most people call it one bit least recently used. But the idea is the following. So you have some items in your cache, right? And whenever you, you have an item uh, that's accessed and you either put in your cache or it's already there, I'm gonna mark it, okay? And so over time, everything will get marked. And the general rule is when I need to evict someone, evict something that's not marked, okay? Of course, eventually everything is marked, so you have nobody to evict. Then you remove all the arcs, marks, and then you can evict somebody again. Okay, so you can think of least recently used as a special case of this because actually the least recently used will always be unmarked when needed. Okay, but it turns out this is, I think, uh, it makes the analysis cleaner. Okay, so those are some, some strategies. And definitely also, there's other things, you know, other degrees of freedom when you're actually working on this problem, like people have maybe like uh, two tiers of caches or something, right? And or like log n tiers, and maybe you bump them up over time to kind of higher levels and stuff like that. We're not really exploring those ideas here. I guess you could have maybe taken your k and partitioned it into like say two halves and explored that kind of idea. Um, I've certainly seen papers like that. I don't remember their acronyms. Okay. All right. So if we approach this from a worst case perspective, the goal is just to like count the number of cash misses and try to minimize it and try to get some kind of worst case guarantee on the minimum number of cash misses. That makes sense, right? Okay, but there's an issue with this model. What's the issue? Yeah, we kind of don't know what's coming. Uh, well, okay, I'm gonna to try to suggest you can't really get any interesting bounds for this perspective. Why? Yeah, so at some level, if, if, if the data access is just not very cache friendly, so if the adversary is just always requesting brand new items I've never seen before and just forcing cache misses, I'll just get an unbounded number of cache misses and it's like, oh, well, I won't be able to distinguish any of these strategies, right? They just all suck because there's, there's no cache possibility available, okay? so. So the most straightforward worst case analysis doesn't really make sense for this kind of problem. So instead we're gonna do things, uh, we're gonna do what's called competitive analysis, which is sort of like approximation, okay? Well, to be a little bit more constructive, what I wanna know is that, oh, if it is possible to cache things, like if I do have a fairly cache friendly data access pattern in hindsight, then I will wanna know that I've, I've been pretty competitive with, with you know, whatever is best. Okay, so, so we will process everything online and we'll have to make decisions on the fly. But afterwards, we can look in hindsight and analyze and say, what was the best possible? So opt in hindsight is well defined. And we can look back and say, okay, how many misses did I have compared to opt in hindsight? You know, was I equal? Was I 10 times bigger? Was I K times bigger? Was it unbounded? Okay, and we could try to minimize this ratio and, and use this ratio to distinguish between one strategy and another. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> all right, so let's take least frequently used uh, as a warm up. Can anyone either think of a way to get a good or any competitive ratio for least frequently used, or try to think of an example where least frequently used will do really, really bad. 
takes on inner passion and give um, take on one stuff in a side home for it. Because every time like but then it's a one foot for the man to try. And that's where the argument is. Yeah. Or maybe I'll take a vote. Whose things least frequently used will be good? Like we'll get some kind of reasonable bound. Okay, so I would say 60% uh, good. Who thinks it'll be bad? Okay, I'll say like 20% bad. Who didn't vote? Doesn't add up. <laughs> Probability is just sum to one, that's from day one. Okay, all right, so it's gonna turn out to be bad. An example I have in mind is just gonna have k equals two, I think, which is easier to describe. So I thought I'd give you guys a chance to try to think of something for say k equals two, that shows that the competitive ratio is essentially unbounded. Yeah. Uh, I'll let you, I'll say that it's okay. You can, you can use a tie in the favor of your argument, whatever argument you have. I'll give you the benefit of a tie. Okay. Oh, okay. So that's like a factor of three halves then, because it's all versus two thirds. Yeah. Okay. So that's still a constant. That's not bad. You're still within a constant factor of opt. Yeah. Yeah. So we're looking for a, well, it's a worst case analysis. So there's certainly cases where least frequently used will do really well. I'm worried about the cases where least frequently used will do badly. Oh, okay, good, good. Yeah, so I guess that's sort of what I had in mind. I guess my version of leaf frequently used was actually keeping a counter even for things out of cash, I guess, which would be similar. So I guess I don't really remember which one LFU refers to, but I guess I'm analyzing a version of LFU, which is not how I described it a moment ago, where I'm just keeping a global counter even when it leaves a cash, but it's going to be the exact same idea as you described, but for that setting. I only have to do it this way because it's already drawn. So, okay. So the idea is basically we're just going to have three items, one, two, and three. We're going to hit one really hard at the beginning, get its tally really high. And then we're just going to alternate two and three, two and three, two and three. And one's always going to be stuck there because the tally is so high and two or three, two or three are always going to be missing. So, uh, okay. So, so if I just hammer one, like Q times for some variable Q. And then I start doing one and two, oh, I missed. Okay, here's three, so it swaps out the two. And then here's two, so I swap out the three and I miss. Oh no, I got that wrong. And here's three, so I swap out the two, right? And one is just holding that, that place down because of this ones that occurred a long time ago and two or three are just swapping each other out and just constantly missing. Whereas obviously the optimum in hindsight, okay, you miss, you get one miss at the beginning because that can't be helped. Um, and then you miss your first two, but then afterwards you replace the one, right? And then afterwards you're all good. You win the rest. 
Okay, so we have uh, like Q or two Q misses on one side and you have zero misses or three misses on the other. So the ratio is Q to, is roughly Q and we can make Q as big a number as we want. So, okay, so uh, fine. So you have some unbounded competitive ratio for least frequently used, okay? And part of what's going on, not entirely, is uh, some of these simple and especially deterministic rules are easy to fool. So, like this is the, uh, the, like the only n case for the uh, LLB? Is it the only one? Uh, it's the first one I came up with, but I'm sure it's not the only one. I, I could have, we could have made k equals three, and I could have played the same game. Oh, but this game is tough, right? Because I mean, then we start playing a, like checkers, where you make a move, then I make a move, then you make a move. Uh, um, it's not clear. Yeah. Uh, who would win in this infinite game? But um, I, you know, ideally we would like to come up with relatively reasonable sounding rules that we can also um, analyze and get upper bounds on instead of just saying Kent couldn't figure out how to break it. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's all right. Okay. So okay. So least frequently used. Uh, just to take a step back, we're analyzing caching. And we're looking at competitive ratios of cash misses to, uh, okay. I'll just do this very quickly. Uh, we're looking just for the people who just came in. Uh, the idea is that you have K cash slots and you have requests coming in. Like I want item one, item two, item three. Whenever an item comes in, it goes into a cash slot, which means you have to choose who to kick out. And over time, you want to minimize the number of request that you miss you want the items to already be in the cache okay but it's online you don't know what's coming in the future when you make these decisions that's what makes it fun and what we're trying to minimize is this competitive ratio the ratio between how many misses we have versus after the requests are done i look in hindsight i figure out the optimum okay so i want to do this online algorithm was kind of a competitive analysis Okay, so, um, okay, great. So that brings us to the, the next one, uh, not recently used, which is uh, has LRU as a special case. This is where we're marking and unmarking stuff. Okay, so uh, whenever an item is, in, is, is accessed, I mark it. And whenever I need to kick someone out, I always kick out something that's not marked. If everyone's marked, then I'll unmark everything, and then I have somebody to kick out. Okay, so it's a marking algorithm. The claim is that the competitive ratio is going to be at most k. Okay. And I guess just to build a little intuition, I don't know if it's really worth our time. Uh, I thought we could see what NRU would do on this thing. So okay, I guess the way I'm notating this is like off by one. That's okay. I'll be consistent. Okay, so round one, there's nothing in the cache. So I, I miss, but then I put one in the cache for the next round. And I hit, and I also mark it. Uh, I guess it got marked as soon as it was put in the cache. Okay, and it's getting marked all the way down. Okay, it's still marked here. And now I have a cache miss. So in this round, these are both marked. Okay. Uh, but I have a cache miss, and now these will both get unmarked, and I get to I kick out any one of them arbitrarily, just to make this harder on us. I'm going to kick out the two because obviously kicking out one is advantageous for those who know what's coming up. But we'll see that we can kick out the two and still do okay. So I'll kick out the two and keep the one, but it's now unmarked. But three is marked. Okay. And next round two comes in, I get another miss. But now I kick out the one. So the two and the three are both marked and they're both in there. So for all of those two threes coming up, I'm going to hit them. I'm going to not miss them. Okay. So compared to, to LFU, which was never able to adapt because it was confused by the earlier ones, this had a few mistakes at the beginning, but eventually cleared out the marks and got the two, three in there like we wanted. 
So not as fast as opt, but we only had a constant number of misses before we got there. Okay, so at least that gives a little bit of hope that you might do better. The claim is that you can get a factor k approximation. So that last one should have shown that we were within a factor two or something of opt. Okay, all right, how are we gonna analyze this? All right, so let's fix a, a sequence of requests. I guess here the indices are given as E's, E's for element, I think. And what we're gonna do is, okay, so, you know, periodically we unmark everything, right? And I'm gonna think of that as demarcating what I call a run. So you're gonna have a run, and then I unmark everything. A run, unmark everything. A run, unmark everything. All right, and this is gonna really help us in our analysis. All right, each run has how many distinct items? K, because each one gives you a mark, and it's that K plus one that forces everything to be unmarked. Okay. So good, it's gonna have K. Now our NRU algorithm, inside just one of these runs, how many mistakes can it make? Uh, at most k, because uh, every one of these distinct items might cause a miss, but then it's in there until at least the end of the run. So each distinct item only creates one miss, there's only k distinct items. So I have at most k misses per run. Okay. Now to get my competitive ratio of k, I need to show that opt has at least one miss per run. Okay. All right, so... I'll first point out that the first item after a run, the beginning of the next run, has to be a new one because that's what forced all the marks to get cleared. Okay, all right. Okay, so I wanna claim that op has at least one miss per run, so to speak. Why? That's kind of true, but I'm looking for something more specific. Yeah, okay, so let me let me sharpen that up a little bit. I think you guys are basically on the right track. All right, so any cache must miss in that previous run, one either one of the last K minus one items, okay, or the first item in the next run. Okay, so every run is gonna miss one. Okay, good. Uh, so, we put that together, uh, number of misses from NRU is going to be K times the number of runs, number of misses by opt is 1 times number of runs, I get at most K. Uh, well, okay, so maybe the, uh, uh, so, so the optimal cache in the previous run could have you know, so there's different items coming in the previous run. It could have been, been re-replacing itself with each other. And maybe that first item from the new run was from a long time ago. And it, it would just never replaced in the middle. So NRU is going to just clean everything out for every run, but some other optimal cache might not. It might be holding on to stuff from the past. Yeah. I guess I went so fast that kind of blew over some of these subtleties. Okay. So that's how we get K. Of course, we haven't done any randomization yet. All right, so that's how we get K. The question is, can we do better? Okay, I usually don't ask this unless we can. So any ideas for making this algorithm just a little bit better? As a hint, any ideas for making this algorithm a little bit better in expectation. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So you're, you're. That's right. So that's one thing kind of interesting about competitive ratio. Okay, this is getting worse in K. So is my cache performing better when the cache is bigger? Because you're competing against the best size K cache. 
So if you make K smaller, your bound will go down. Your ratio will get better, but it's compared to a smaller cache. This doesn't mean the actual real performance is better. Yeah. We would like to improve the dependence on K. If it was square root K, that would be better. If it was K over two, that would be better. But any, any ideas for tweaking is gonna be something similar to this one bit LRU algorithm to improve its kind of worst case. Yeah. Ah, that's what well, we could. So this one was arbitrary. Yeah, and we made no assumptions. But that suggests, hey, why not choose one uniformly at random? And that's exactly what we're going to do. Okay, so randomized NRU. I'm going to evict a uniformly random a marked item whenever I need to. That's the only difference. And the claim is now we can improve the competitive ratio to log k in expectation. So that'll be like expected value of the competitive ratio is less than or equal to log k. Okay. All right. So uh, the initial setup is similar. We're going to also focus on runs just like before, split out when we mark things. In fact, the, none of the marking stuff. Yeah, so all this is kind of kind of the same. Um, none of the marking stuff really actually changes, I think. I think both algorithms will have the same exact uh, runs, if I'm not mistaken. It doesn't really matter. Okay. I'm going to make a slight distinction this time, though. I'm going to pay attention to, so in the run, right, and there's K distinct items that show up in that run. Some of them appeared in that previous run, and they just happened to repeat. So there's some small chance we could have cached them and saved them. Others are brand new. They weren't even in the previous run. Those are a little bit harder to cache. Okay, so that's what I'm going to call new and repeat items, depending on whether or not those items appeared in the previous run. Okay. All right, so this argument is going to be a little more sophisticated because we need a potential function. And I dropped my pencil. Okay, so we need a potential function. Uh, which is going to be phi, which counts the number of items that are simultaneously in ops cache, but not in my cache. So it's really how many items, how far off am I from opt in some sense and from what opt is doing. Okay. And then we're going to break the analysis into one run at a time, like before. And I'm running, I'm calling phi in to be the value of the potential before the run starts, and the phi out to be the value of the potential after the run. And L is the number of new items out of K in that run, so K minus L would be the remaining number of repeat items. All the items either are new or repeating. Okay. The first claim is that opt must miss at least L minus phi in items. Why? And there's traces of correctness, but not quite correct. Yeah. So maybe I should point out that the new items are going to be new for NRU, right? Because NRU is only going to be holding on to items from the previous run when they get unmarked. So anything before that, NRU has no chance. 
So all those L items, NRU is definitely going to miss. It's definitely not an, an, an NRU's cash. Ah, yeah, okay. Good. So at the beginning of that run, there's going to be these L items that weren't even in the previous run. Okay. Of those L, none of them are in NRU's cache. Okay. And at most, phi of them could be an opt. Okay. Because phi is counting the number of items that are in opt, but not in NRU. And all those items are not in NRU. So, okay. So maybe the opt has phi in of them. But the remaining L minus phi in it definitely has to miss. Okay, so opt is going to miss at least L minus phi in. Okay. Next, opt is also going to miss at least phi out. Yeah, I think that's right. So let me let me ho try to read. Hopefully, you tell me if I'm saying what you're saying. Uh, okay. So we know that uh, there's going to be k items, right? And they're going to those k distinct items from that run. They're all going to be in NRU at the end. Okay. Now phi out is counting the number of items that are in ops cache but non NRU at the end. Okay. So let's say uh, phi out is like ten. Then opt must have kicked out ten of those k. That are in NRU. But every time op kicks something out, there must have been a cache miss. Okay. So op misses at least phi out items. Is that kind of what you had in mind? Okay. Okay, yeah, so all right, so let's say, okay, so if there's K items from in that run, they all are going to be in NRU at the end. And then phi out, I mean, opt is holding on to phi out items, which means it only kind of has like K minus phi out slots to work with to process through those K. So if you have a K minus phi out slots and you're trying to take in K, you have to have phi out misses. Okay. I think that's slightly different than how it worded before, but I think that's better. Okay, good. All right. So if we combine those things, then opt has to miss at least the average of these two, L plus, and now here's just the, the increase in potential over the course of the run. So L is a number of new items, and then the rest is some change in potential. And you can imagine how those are going to add up over all the runs. All right, now let's look at NRU. So NRU is going to miss all of the L new items, right? Nothing it can do. Those are new items. All right, but then there's going to be some repeat items, okay? What are the odds that NRU is going to miss the first repeat item in the worst case? So what would be the worst case? So ideally, I would love to already have the repeat items in cash when they show up. Right, but they might get kicked out and stuff like that. So it's sort of like, what's the worst case, especially in terms of when do the new items compare, appear and when do the repeat items appear? Yes, 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 yes. So, okay, or let me put it this way. From your perspective as NRU, would you like the new items to come at the beginning of the run or at the end of the run? At the end, because those are going to clear things out. Whereas the worst case is they all come at the beginning. So in the worst case, all the new items come at the beginning, including the first one that resets the marks, and it kicks out L of your K right away. 
Sorry? Well, they're not raw. Well, so this is online, and the online algorithm doesn't know your random choices. Okay? So when that first repeat comes in, what are the odds that you've already kicked it out? In the worst case. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I think what I had in mind was L over K. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. The odds are missing at most L over K. Okay. Now what about the second repeat? Well, now the first repeat has come in and possibly kicked it out the second repeat. So now instead of having L things threatening you, it's L plus one. Okay. What about the generic ice? L plus I minus one, I believe, over K. All right. Okay. Good. Okay. So, uh, and are you going to miss the I3P? You know, it's probably L plus I minus 1 over K. So now the expected number of misses is I'm summing over I from 1 to, I guess, K minus L. L plus I minus 1 over K. Okay. And here we're going to do a little bit of AMGM. So L plus I minus 1 times k plus 1 minus i is at most l times k, okay? So that gives us, you guys can tell me if I cheated. That's what I wrote down. Um, l over k plus 1 minus i, okay, uh, and this is at most l times log of k, because in the denominator we have one of those, we have part of a harmonics sum. Okay. All right, so, okay, so what do we show? Okay, so in a single phase, the op misses at least L plus the change of potential divided by two, whereas NRU misses at most L plus L log K. The first L is for the L new items, L log K is for the, is for the repeat items, okay? And now we're gonna sum everything up over all the phases. So let's let capital L be the total number of new items over all the phases. So the sum of little L's will be capital L. That means op misses, you know, at least well, done directly, it's going to miss at least L over 2 plus one half of sort of like the potential at the end minus the potential at the beginning, right? Because they've got a telescoping series for all the potentials. Okay, so what is the potential at the very beginning? Zero, because all the caches are empty. And the potential at the end is? Yes, and it's at least, it's at least zero, that's all that matters. Okay, so it's at least L over two. Okay, and then uh, for a number of misses of NRU, we'll get like uh, L times one plus log K, right? So when we look at the, the competitive ratio and expectation, then you know we'll get one plus log KL divided by L over two. So you'll get, I guess, two times one plus long K, you know, big old log K. All right, so I, I think I lied because I think I said log K competitive ratio. So it's just been big old log K, but okay, at the end of the year, we're all friends. It's okay. All right. Okay, cool. So randomization gets you, um, a better competitive algorithm uh, for caching from a certain worst case perspective. All right.
I think I have time left. This can potentially go pretty quickly. This is kind of fun. To do what's called the buyer rent problem. It's also an online problem. Okay. For some reason, it's always framed in terms of skis. These are some slides I made a couple of years ago when I was more enthusiastic about pictures. Uh, okay. So, all right. So skiing, right? You guys may or may not have gone skiing. Okay. But the thing about skiing, it's really fun, but you have to have skis. So you go to the ski resort and you can either buy skis or you can rent skis. In my case, I never really skied enough to make it worth it to buy. But renting is like not that cheap either. Like it's still pretty expensive. It's not like, it's like a, a small multiple factor bigger is, is to buy it. So, all right. So whether or not you rent or buy skis depends on how many times you're going to go skiing, which of course, maybe you don't know how many times you're going to go skiing again. Or like my deepest fear is I'll ruin my knees going skiing. So I never know how many times I can ski again before I destroy my knees. Um, I think the, the only way out is to not ski. Okay. Yeah, I can't hurt my knees around here. Flat terrain. That's right. Very safe. Easy on the knees. So would a beach be. A beach would also be easy on my knees. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So the question is, should you rent or should you buy? Other situations where this might occur. Uh, in the modern day, you hardly need to buy a car. You can kind of get around on Uber and Lyft maybe. Let's say you're like kind of within walking distance of here and you can use Uber and Lyft for everything else, right? That's sort of a possibility. So, so are you living in a city or something? So, you know, should you buy a car or should you just keep using Uber and Lyft and keep hoping they give you those promotional discounts forever, right? You know, it's hard to say. Okay. Uh, but besides these fun examples, you know, it just shows up in all sorts of real systems. So here's just, I guess, one example. A hard drive takes a moment or two to actually spin up, right? And then you just read something once. And the question is, should you just keep it spinning in case you're about to read something else again? Or should you, should you shut it down? In which case, when you do need to read or write, you have to kind of turn it back on and load it back up, okay? So there's some decisions to be made here. Should you pay the small continuous fee or should you kind of do some trade-off for potential big upfront costs? Okay, and that's just one example. You can imagine like a real system having choices like this everywhere. Okay, all right, so we'll go back to skiing and here's the model. I'm gonna let K be an integer. It's really like the only input to this problem. This is the cost of buying a pair of skis. Okay. And we'll say it costs $1 a day per rent ski. So I've normalized everything. Okay. And L is going to denote the number of days we end up skiing in hindsight. So once you're finally on your deathbed and you look back and you say, I should have bought those skis, or I'm so glad I bought those skis, or I wish I had my knees, right? <laughs> And the problem is only hard because we don't know L. And every day we go out to ski and we have to decide whether or not to buy skis unless we've already bought them. Okay. All right. So if we knew L, the total number of days you're gonna ski, then this problem would be very easy. If L is anything less than K, you should rent every day. Because then you only pay L, which is less than K. If L is going to be bigger than K, you should buy it right away. So one way or another, opt is the minimum of K and L. The minimum of the cost of skis or the total number of days you end up skiing. All right. All right, so our goal is to, you know, while operating online, get some kind of something competitive with the minimum of KRL, okay? Even though you don't know L. All right, so here's a good warm up. Anyone think of a two competitive algorithm? That means you should get two times the minimum of KRL at most. Okay, so tell me what you do on, uh, so on day one, what do you do?
Okay, so what do you do on day one? Ah, you rent for K days or maybe K minus one days and the K day you buy. Okay, so at least the first K minus one days you're perfect because you should have been renting. And on the K day, you're like, I should have bought. Then you finally buy. You spent a total of 2K minus one and opt was K. Okay, so you'll be within a factor of two. Okay, good. You can even show that's best possible. That's an exercise. All right. Okay, good. All right, so now we're gonna to try to do better, okay? Now as a warm up, I'm gonna relax the model, okay? Imagine you're allowed to buy or rent one ski at a time, okay? So you can buy one ski for K over $2 and rent one ski for half a dollar. You still have to have two skis, one pair of skis, this always confuses me, Two sky Eve. Uh, uh, each day. Okay? All right. The one thing to point out is that opt has not changed. It's still the case, even though it was half skis, that you should rent until it makes sense to buy. Or you should rent or buy, whatever. Okay? Opt has not changed. And now the question to you is can you do better? Then a two competitive ratio what is this. Maybe I should take a vote first. Who thinks yes, we can do better, that this freedom will buy you something? Okay, I'll say like 50% uh, said yes. And who says no, you won't be able to do better? Okay, one. All right, voter fatigue. All right, okay. Uh, so the answer is gonna be yes, but any ideas? Okay, last time we'll just get you two again, so. Okay, yeah, for some reason when I did it, I worked out 5K over 8. I'm not sure why I didn't try K over 2. I mean, I did try it. So I don't know why I chose 5K over 8. It's for historical reasons. But it's still the, basically the same idea. Now we have a little bit of degree of freedom where at some point in the middle, uh, I can just buy one ski. Uh, so if I, if I bought uh, skis on 5K over 8 and just assume K is divisible by 8, um, and on the second, on day K, finally bought the second key. And I've calculated, okay, uh, before day five K over eight, you're just renting, so you're doing great. Between five K over eight and K, well, you get nine fifth opt uh, for five K over eight, and you're actually still doing a little bit, it should just get better because you kind of put some down payment on, and now you're kind of renting at a cheaper cost than opt is renting, because opt is paying one on those in-between days, and you're only paying half on those in-between days. And for L equal to K, you get a 29 over 16 is a cost. And after that, neither of you are paying anymore. So that'll also give you the fixed thing. So both of those numbers are less than two. Ah, okay. So yeah, okay. So I must have tried K over two and it didn't quite work. So I tweaked it a little and it worked out better. That must have been what happened. Okay, good. All right, so you can do a little bit better. All right, okay. All right, so we're gonna take this to the next model. This is called a liquid ski model. Okay. So seemingly, if I allowed you to buy one fourth of a ski at a time, <laughs> then you could probably like choose some numbers, weird numbers like 5K over eight and, and figure out how to do even better than we just did. Okay. So we're gonna push that to the extreme. Every day, you're allowed to buy a fractional amount of a ski, any fraction you want and they gradually assemble a full ski over time and then two skis uh, over time. Okay, so actually we're gonna do a fraction of a pair of skis, so that is a stupid plural, okay. All right, so how are we gonna model this? So every day uh, on day 10, X10 is the fractional amount of skis you buy. So X1 is the fractional amount of skis you buy day one, X2 is the fractional amount of skis day two. 
And then y, each y1, y2, y3 is the amount you rent, which has to just be the remainder. So if you buy one tenth of a ski on day one, you're renting nine tenth of a ski and you pay the proportional price. Okay. So after L days, your total cost will be K times all the fractions you've bought X1 through XL because the total cost is K and then you're buying fractions of K. And then your renting cost is in the Y's. And the, the constraint is, okay, on day 10, the fractional amount I've bought through the first 10 days plus the amount I rent has to be at least one. And of course, to minimize, you're just going to set yi equal to one minus this sum of fractional amounts each day. So really, it just comes down to choosing x i's. Okay. All right. So, okay, so one thing kind of funny is that uh, in hindsight, opt has not changed. So even though you can now buy liquid skis, uh, you would still do the same thing. If L was less than K, just rent the whole thing every day. If L is bigger than K, buy everything all at once. Okay, kind of odd. All right, so, okay, so, here's the strategy we're going to pursue. Okay, I'm, uh, what we're going to kind of do is choose some parameter delta. Okay. Think of delta, I don't know, for simplicity being one half. It'll be a different number ultimately. But I'm going to kind of commit to paying one and a half dollars every day until I end up buying the ski in some sense. But that means sort of like during all those rent days, the first K days, my competitive ratio is 1.5 because I'm paying one and a half dollars or one plus delta. And we're also going to choose delta so we end up buying the ski exact completely by day K. So we'll figure out the math at the end to work it out. So that means the first K days you have paid one plus delta times K and opt would be K. So you get a competitive ratio of K of one plus delta. Okay, so we're kind of choosing competitive ratio ahead of time and I'm working backwards to figure out what the X's should be. Okay, so for X1, I know that one plus delta is equal to the amount I pay, K times X1 plus one minus X1, that represents Y1, the renting. Okay, so that means what does X1 equal? Delta over K minus one. Okay, I think that's correct. All right, then I go to day two, I'm committed to paying one plus delta dollars. So I'll pay K times X2 plus the, the renting cost, which is now one minus X1 minus X2. What does that tell me X2 is? Okay, and then on and on. What about the i day? So on the i day, k times xi plus the renting cost is subtracting out that partial sum of x's. What would xi be equal to? It should be x1. Okay. K minus one. Okay, so uh, I guess I forgot to erase this, so it'll be easier this way. <laughs> okay, so we got the formula for XI. Now I know that on day K, I wanna buy the whole ski. So I wrote one is equal to X1 plus up to XK, okay? And for example, if I unroll XK, then I'll get delta over K minus one, and I sort of have one copy of X1 plus another one over K minus one copies of X1 from the XK side. So you get K over K minus one times the partial sum through the first K. And you can keep unrolling in this fashion. And so you end up with delta over K minus one plus this geometric series uh, with factor K over K minus one. Okay. And if I did my math correctly, you'll get that biggest term minus the smallest term and then sort of that the K minus one denominator disappeared because that's how this geometric series things works. Okay. So you get one is equal to delta times 
roughly k over k minus 1 to the k minus roughly 1 if k is big. Okay? All right. So, oh, I forgot to erase a lot of important stuff. That's okay. Um, okay, so just solving this and, you know, flipping some things around. Delta is equal to 1 over k over k minus 1 to the k minus k over k minus 1. If I take k to infinity, since it's sort of an ugly fraction, so let's just think of k being big, this is going to converge to e. Okay. And this is going to converge to 1. So you get 1 over e minus 1. The competitive ratio was 1 plus delta, so we get e over e minus 1. Okay. All right, good. So. Uh, which is about 1.582 or something. Like that. Okay, so that's better than two. All right, so now, okay, okay. So we've sort of just done these thought experiments where I told you you can buy like infinitely indivisible skis and stuff like that, uh, but you can't, okay? So how are we now gonna turn this into a real life strategy for buying skis or cars or whatever other major life decision you have? in mind. How do I turn this into a discrete decision? Yeah. Uh, so if we did an integer program, well, A, if we just left it as an integer program, it might be MP hard to solve or something. It's not clear that we can solve it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so just give me one buzzword related to this class. How are you going to decide? Ah, okay. So at some level, we want to take what's essentially a continuous solution to the problem and randomly round it to a discrete solution. And we're going to be able to do it in a way we don't lose anything, actually, either in the approximation factor. Okay. So, all right. Wait, I, did, I forgot to... <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, that's fine. So here's what we're going to do. Okay. So let me, um, okay. We have enough time and it's not so complicated. So let me put this in the corner. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I want to interpret. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm committed to buying someday between one and day K, right? At some level, the XIs will reach one in day K. And I want to interpret XI as the probability that I buy on day I, okay? So the probabilities are all gonna have day one plus day two plus day two up through day k, they should all add up to one because that's what we did, x1 plus up to xk all was equal to one, okay? All right, so how can I actually turn this into an algorithm? So I have these numbers, they add up to one. And I want, uh, yeah, each xi to represent the probability that I actually buy on day i. So as a picture, here's like a line between zero and one, and this would be like uh, x1 and okay, we'll pick a uniformly random number in between and see where it lands, and that's the day we'll buy. Okay. So the nice thing about this algorithm. You don't know L in advance, but you can compute the X's in advance, right? Because X's don't depend on L. This is actually like, uh, yeah, once the only input to this algorithm is K, and otherwise the numbers XI is, can just be computed and crunched following that formula, okay? So you can just say on the i day I'm gonna buy and you have to commit to it, 
uh, and then and when the ice day comes around, you buy it. Or if the ice day never comes around, you'll be glad you rented. Okay, an expectation. Uh, okay, so what's the uh, okay? All right, so well, we need to calculate the amount of money I spend uh, from the buying side and the amount of money I spend on the renting side, and we'll add them up. Okay, so uh, knowing L in hindsight. So if I want to look at the expected cost from buying, okay, I'm summing up uh, the days from one to L. Uh, okay, I'm really only concerned about the case where, uh, well, okay, uh, okay, the probability that I buy on day I times k okay so this is uh exactly k times x1 plus all the way up to xl okay i probably should have instead wrote minimum of l and k and this should be minimum uh of l and k all right Okay, and or I guess it could have just been XL where, yeah, okay. We'll just call it XL, but the X size after day K are all zero. That's the right way to think of it. Okay, good. That's easier notationally. Okay, so, okay, now we can go to the renting side. So now what's the probability that I rent on day I? Okay, how would I express the probability that I rent on day I? Yeah, why is it one minus the sum? Like expand just a little more. Yeah, okay, so it's the probably I don't buy in the first I days, which means that the the random number fell outside X1 plus all the way up to XI. Okay, which happens is probably one minus X1 up through XI. Uh, is equal to one minus XI, all right? So now the expected cost renting uh, and this is by the way equal to yi we didn't write out yi explicitly but that's what it was okay so the expected cost renting is summing up from day one to day l yi okay so when we put everything together the total expected cost is k times x1 through xl plus y1 plus yl. This is exactly the cost of our liquid ski solution, which we already showed was 1 plus delta competitive, where delta is this funky number, 1.58 or something. You know, solve e over e minus 1. Okay. So that means our expected competitive ratio is one plus delta, which converges as k goes to infinity to e over e minus one. Okay, and that's that's the, the proof. So, but I think maybe in hindsight, what did we do? So this problem, by the way, I think initially, let me kind of summarize what happened. Uh, you know, initially, right, it seemed like there wasn't much we can do. So when we're presented with the originally, right, buy skis or not, really, we couldn't do much better than, oh, just buy the skis on the, on the day you finally regret renting, okay? And you can show that's best you can do deterministically. And as an exercise, we explored fractional solutions. And then you can see, oh, fractional solutions can do kind of better which is maybe not too surprising. We've seen LPs that can do better than integer programs and stuff like that, okay? But of course, the obvious issue is that we kind of strayed away from the original problem of actually renting or buying real skis. But we're what we're able to do is we're able to take this very good continuous solution, this kind of very elegant, oh, let's just pay one plus delta a day and then reverse engineer what's gonna, what it's gonna give us. 
and we're able to turn it into a randomized discrete solution while losing nothing. Okay, so this is sort of yet another example of this idea of interpreting fractional numbers as probabilities. Okay, and then so at some level you get the, the freedom and leverage uh, and the flexibility, all the power that comes from getting to use fractions in situations where fractions don't actually exist, but you reinterpret fractions not as a fraction of a ski, but the probability of buying a ski. This is very similar to like randomized rounding and stuff like that, right? Okay, like reminds me of a philosophical question like, what is half a chair? I feel like we had this kind of question like a high school English or something, and it's like, oh, if there's only two legs on a chair, does it count as a chair? It's kind of like a very dumb question. But the answer from this kind of lecture is, oh, a half a chair is a, probably, is a chair that's there half the time. That makes much more sense than a two-legged chair, right? Okay. All right, so that is uh, it for that lecture.